Okay, everybody, let's, uh, let's get started. I told you I'd start on time, and uh, so we need to grab a seat. There's, what do you know? There's plenty of seating right up front. I would, uh, I would ask that you guys come in, find a spot. Um, if you could, right here, I, I have a couple of passages I'd like to open with. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, and, a, and I want to look at Psalm 119. Um, would somebody be willing to read Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3? Would somebody be willing to read Ezekiel 3, 1 through 3? Anyone? Okay. No, go ahead. All right, we're not going to fight over it. No, she's got it. Okay, and then who can uh, do Psalm 119, verse 103? Okay, I see that hand. Thank you. So as we, as we look at that, let's pray real quickly before we begin. And uh, those who are looking up the passage, you have the okay to keep your eyes open while I pray. Lord Jesus, this is, a, this is your time that we have set aside to become better followers of you. I ask for your, your guidance. I ask that you would give us ability by your Holy Spirit. Father, keep me from saying things that I ought not say because they're extra. And I may think they're clever, but they're not what you want. Give us ears to hear. Give us understanding. Help us to understand beyond our own ability and that we might have wisdom, not information. And we would apply it to our lives. Thank you that we have um, careful men and women who love you, that want to know you better. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. So uh, part of the reason why I want to teach this class is because I want you to have a passion for knowing who God is. And... Uh, and a passion for his word. So let's start with Ezekiel 3, verses 1 through 3. She's got it. Bonus verses, never a bad thing. Oh, sorry. You're good. So what do we hear there? Let's, let's, let's kind of hear that, but then I think it'll really come home when we hear from Psalm 119. Isn't it going to be, Eric? It's going to be very obvious. 103. 103. NIV. NIV. This class, that matters, baby. <laughs> Okay, common phraseology in those two verses that are very sp spread apart in, in where they came in, in the time frame of Israel, what's the imagery we hear in both passages? Sweeter than honey. Sweeter than honey. For Ezekiel, it's very graphic image of Ezekiel eating a scroll. The scroll with is literally the words of God written on it. He's being asked to, to, to relate this imagery of eating a scroll, the very word of God, eating it, and nur getting nourished from it, and having a wonderful sweet savor to it. Is that not true also from the Psalm 119 passage? I, they, they love the word of God so much that it's like honey. There are other, other spots in Scripture that use that same imagery of honey. I would, I would that you all would have a passion for God's word, that you would, well, I'm going to switch metaphors a little bit, but thirst for it, desire it, have a hunger for it, like you would the sweetness of honey. And, and as you take in God's word, that you become a more um, reasoned and wise reader of Scripture so that we could live out 
J.I. Packer's quote up here, that there's a difference between reading and studying. He said there's a difference between reading scripture and studying scripture. And for him, the importance came that, that there is a God. I want to read this. J.I. Packer said, It's as if God said to each one of you, Here I am. I want you to know me. God is not putting a barrier between you and himself if you're a follower of his. Who does he put barriers between him him and himself and others? Those who do not know me. He uses the foolishness of this world to confuse or confound the wise. There is constant imagery between biblical truth and wisdom and earthly truth and wisdom. And Isaiah tells us that the Lord's ways and thoughts are so far above our thoughts, it's a gulf. And we, we, it's almost unknowable. And that the, the difference between the way God thinks about things and the way we think about things, the, the path that you and I walk in this life seems like it's, well, it's circuitous. It's, it goes and it's got... Uh, sweeping back on you know the path you're walking it seems like you're just wandering around next thing you know you find something that the Lord wanted for you all along as God saw it it was a straight path but he had to take you on that path to get you where he wanted and and we can we can we can absolutely know who God is in the pages of scripture and I want to give you encouragement because I know some of you are like Tom there's a heavy strong current that I'm swimming against here It, it feels it feels harder than I can handle. No, it's not. Just like any other skill that you've learned. Were you great at it the first time you tried it? The answer is negative. Not. No way. Some sort of technical advanced skill did not come immediately to you. But if you had passion for it, You kept trying, even though it was difficult. And that's what I want for you. That there are passages that we've talked about, like we we, uh, encountered this week, that the baptism for the dead, what in the world is that all about, you know? What does our author say about that passage? There's no less than 40 different takes or understandings of potential understandings of that passage. Who knows what it means? Our our passage from last week out of, uh, was it 2 Timothy, Jeannie? Uh, women will be saved in childbirth. <coughs> what in the world does that mean? And did you see some of those, you, you hopefully saw some of the things that I've already done, I've already modeled for you when we were talking about the women will be saved through childbirth passage. What did I tell you I could say definitively about that passage? I could definitively tell you what it did not say. And our author shared some of that wisdom in our pages this week. He's like, look, we, we can know some things about a passage, but we can't, some, some passages are too hard. We can't know everything about it. But those that are difficult, let's land on what we do know about it. And, and that's where I said, you know what I can say about women being saved in childbirth? I can definitely say what it's not saying. And that is that you're saved and go to heaven because you have a child. That is not what it's saying. Clearly, Paul, in the rest of his letters, writes over and over again that you are saved through faith and not of your own. Because if you're a good laborer and have many children, boy, you must be really saved. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been the witness of three children being born, and women, you are definitely going to have a bigger mansion than me. Because that is work. But, it, but I, I don't think that's what Paul is saying, that you're saved through that work. And so when we come to these passages, you know, and we have to make those, those uh, well, we've got to land somewhere kind of decision. Uh, what's the author used for that word in the first chapter he's talked about it? Convenience, I think. Yeah. They're, they're decisions of convenience. Okay, what's, what do we, we have to come down somewhere. What do we think Paul means there? I don't know. And I'm glad I'm not the one that has to decide that. And it's, you know. So I I don't want us to be focused on those passages of Scripture and say, well, that's all of Scripture for me. And and tonight, 
if you've read your book or if you're, if you're in the middle of reading your book, you've discovered that this book gives tremendous tools on how to read and know what Scripture is saying. It gives us tremendous tools in how to read an epistle, right? And <clears throat> how many of you were confused by the book this week when you read it? Okay. Was it less than last week? It was very much more understandable. There was one really big word that I wrote on the board, homogeneous. Did anyone have to look that one up? Ho homogeneous means everything's the same, right? Uh, all 12 eggs are basically homogeneous. They're all eggs. They all have a yolk and a, well, you know what I'm saying. And, and one of the things that the author says is, look, we have to treat the epistles differently. They're letters. We have to treat them differently. But the problem, the main problem is, is that they're all different from each other, by and large. There are different types of letters. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are different aspects in the letters. There are, there are different reasons for the letters, right? And so if you're wondering what the big idea, which I always try to boil down for you every week, it's that we have to figure out the reason for the letter. The author uses the term occasion. What was the occasion for the letter, right? Uh, <clears throat> I was talking actually to Amando this week, and he's like, hey, you know, help me understand this. This is, this is confusing. And I said, brother, it's okay. I think I got it. And I said, I, I want to tell you a story that will help you understand why occasion is a big deal and how we can actually abuse the text. We can do a disservice to a Bible passage by not understanding the occasion. I said, what if you were to encounter a text that I sent my friend, let's say my, my friend Carrie, and it said this. It's really bad out there. Don't drive. The, the streets are dangerous. Better to stay at home. Tom, what if, what if you got that text and you, f you found that text of mine and, it, and it, I wrote that in January and you found it in July <laughs> and you read it and you said, Tom said that the streets are dangerous. Don't drive your car. It, under any circumstances, never drive your car. And you didn't figure out that the, the reason I texted Carrie was because it was a Friday in January and a massive snowstorm had hit and the plows weren't out and there were lots of accidents on the streets. And instead of inferring that the fact that I should never drive my car on the streets again, you missed it because you didn't know the that's right, the circumstances, the occasion. That, in a nutshell, is what this chapter is trying to teach you. We are someone finding my text way down in July, and we're reading these books, and we're pulling it completely. See how that works? You pull it completely out of context because you don't know the occasion. And that's the best way I thought, man, having a conversation with Amanda, we were just kind of back and forth, and he goes, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. I think I understand what you're saying. And I'm going, that's the right illustration then. Because it continues to apply. Because then, let's take it a step further and say, okay, now we understand that it was sent on January, whatever that Friday was, the date. Somebody will remember it, probably Sadie, because she remembers all the dates. But, <laughs> but uh, what if we take that text and we go, you know what, there's a principle here. What would that principle be that we could draw from that text that didn't pull it out of context? Know your conditions. Driving your car is a big responsibility. To know your conditions will help you be a safer driver. That's, that is, where's Lee? Supra-cultural. <laughs> that goes beyond any circumstance you might fall into because it's a general rule. It's a, it's a guideline. It's a principle, right? The principle is that I obviously took driving very seriously, that I wanted my friend to know, hey, the conditions are terrible, and since driving is such a responsibility, be careful. That doesn't matter whether the, the, the circumstances are, are snow, rain, whatever, fog, uh, clear day, 
you know, be a defensive driver maybe. That's a, a, a very applicational follow-up of that. And so that's also what we want to do with Paul's letters. Just because we're not in the occasion, does that mean that you and I don't have any reason to use that in a very um, concrete and, and good way, positive way? We absolutely must be looking at the scripture that way. Even though we're not Corinthians sitting in the first century in Corinth, uh, writing Paul about all these things. You and I can draw principles that God wants us to have. As J.I. Packer says, Hi, state your name. I want you to know me. If, here's a good exercise that, that uh, a friend of mine suggested. Take, take Ephesians chapter 1 and take the plural pronouns out of there and put your name in it. And that's exactly how God feels about you. Just turn your Bible right now. Find Ephesians chapter 1 and see what Paul's writing in there in the, after the first couple of verses. And you put your, your, your name in there and see if that isn't just an amazing thing that God is saying to you. Because he's a personal God, we can say that that's true. Because he's a caring God, we can say that the pages of that scripture are true. All praise to the God, uh, NLT, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed Tom with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because Tom has been united with Christ. You see what I'm saying? Even before Tom, before God made the world, God loved Tom and chose Tom in, in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt Tom into his own family by bringing Tom to himself through Jesus Christ. That's how I want you to see Scripture. I want you to know God in such a vital, personal, knowledgeable way that you can see yourself in God's story. You can write that down because it's not original to me. I want you to see yourself in God's story because he's telling his story through each one of his children. It's being written through you. Are you writing an Ian's of scripture like Paul wrote Corinthians? You and I aren't writing Ian's, but God is writing his story through us. It's unfolding. God is waiting. God is being patient because he wants the full measure to come to him before he returns. It's impossible for you and I to feel unimportant when we start doing that. It's impossible for us to believe the lies of the enemy who tries to tell you you don't matter, who tries to tell you that this scripture is too hard, that you can never know God through the pages of scripture. You didn't have seminary degree. You didn't have enough this or that. You are lesser than whatever is needed. You don't measure up. That's what the enemy would have you believe. You know how I believe, know that? Because that's what's running through my mind every time I go to preach. Who, who do you think you are, Tom? Why do you think you should say anything about this passage? You, you, don't, you don't even obey this scripture that you're going to preach. You're, you're less than. No one wants to hear what you have to say. Th those are literally, ask someone who's walked alongside me, Whenever I've preached scripture, when I'm, when I'm going to preach on a Sunday morning, boy, I tell you what, when I was preaching, uh, last time I was here, when I was preaching about the woman caught in, in adultery, Tom, there's no way you should be preaching this passage. It's not even really scripture. What? Right? So those kinds of things, I'm here to tell you, stop. You don't have to believe that. Because there's a God who wants you to know him. And there's a Holy Spirit that can teach you that. And so why do we want to learn how to read the epistles? The author says it really well. Because it's a majority of the New Testament. If you take the New Testament, the big chunk of it is all letters. Right? Even the book of Revelation is technically, section, whole sections of it are letters that contain prophecy. Right? 
And so uh, we need to figure out how to read these things and read them well. And we can know the occasion that things are being written. And so as the, uh, as the authors, plural, talk about it, they, they uh, discuss the fact that there is the nature of the epistles. They're not homogeneous. But there are some things that are constant. Page 59, if you have your book. I want to draw your attention to the list. Page 59 at the top, see that there? Name of the writer, name of the recipient, greeting, prayer, wish, or or thanksgiving, body, final greeting and farewell. So these are things that are common to the epistles within the, the New Testament. But they're also common to letters at the time when the Bible was being written, right? So if little Johnny was writing his friend little Timmy uh, from you know, one side of the city to the other or from this city to that city, let's say he lives in Ephesus, he's writing his friend in Corinth, these six, you see it because we have letters from people. We actually have posts from people because they wrote on like rocks or they wrote on thicker paper that would actually last the test of time. And they, they all sort of follow this same same uh, breakdown. And I, I talked to, um, th- we have a, a retired English teacher in here. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> that may know a thing or two about writing letters. And is this also true theoretically today if we actually actually wrote letters to one another today? Do we still do these sorts of things? No. It's the same format. Yeah. It's all in the same format. We have different reasons for writing now than we did then. It's a lost art. Right. They don't often. Yep. But they're treasured by soldiers. They're treasured by people who are wanting you to join some type of movement against the government or to they say you should know the government. They do transactions for you to get into some kind of but um, as far as just writing personal epistles, <coughs> that's all it's almost in the second half of the twentieth century, almost a lost art. So if, if you want to get letters, you should contact me because I have a daughter who is a very excellent letter writer. She writes a letter almost... Okay. She writes a letter to someone almost every day and puts a postage stamp on it and sends it. But So let me loop back to that, though. So what I hear you saying is that even today, letter writing is of high importance and value. It's treasured. And so... Is it any wonder that the majority of the New Testament is written as one of those? I mean, it's, it's so... And the fact that there is this importance, what I would call an importance trajectory, there's this high level of importance that continues even to today. That God has sort of set in our DNA, you know, to, to want to cherish these things and to seek them out. I, 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 it's interesting because the world just gets it even. You know, high, high dollars being spent because Abraham Lincoln wrote someone, you know, in Salem, Illinois or whatever, and, and it was about this little side something or other, but it's so important that they want to preserve it. And so I think it's pretty strategic on God's part that, that guardrails for our faith are being produced through letters. And so, have I made a strong enough case that you should figure out how to read a letter in the New Testament? And it's really, there's some clear things we can do. Does it have those, those six uh, points to it in, in the text? Uh, some of them have some of them. Some of them don't have parts. Maybe number... Um, like, let me, look, let me look at page 59 again. Maybe number three is missing in one, or, or number one is missing, or maybe it, it misses number six. Something you can ask yourself. Why, why would that not be in there, I wonder? It's a good question to ask. And so we have these um, 
points that are always in the text. I've already talked about occasion. We want to know the occasion. So then uh, the author continues on on um, page 61, and he talks about historical context. And I just want to make a couple points on this and then, and then move to literary. Did anyone watch the video? You should watch. The, those are really good, aren't they? Yeah. If you've not happened upon YouTube channel, The Bible Project, you need to get there. Uh, it's one of the things that shows up in the filament Bible. You, uh, you scan it on there, and up pops Bible Project. I love it. Like when I talk to someone who's a new Christian, and I say, here's this Bible, here's the app. Let's talk about John 1. And they watch these great videos uh, from the Bible Project on John. It's a confidence builder. So historical context. <coughs> read the whole, th whole thing start to finish. Don't you love it when the author said, do you read a letter that comes to you, like the first paragraph and that's it? No, you read it all the way through. Sadie, when she gets a letter, immediately rips the, the envelope to shreds, pulls it out, stands in the kitchen and reads her letter aloud from start to finish. And she's so excited, you cannot even believe it. She can't even sometimes get through it because she's laughing. She's so excited and she can't read herself. She just can't get, get herself together to read it out loud. What if we read scripture like that? It would be amazing. And uh, the, the hardest one to do that uh, as far as the epistles is probably Romans. That puppy's a long one. You can still do it, though. Just read it from start to finish. Get the flow of it. He says, read it a couple of times. Isn't that a great piece of advice? Read it aloud. You actually remember better when you hear something read aloud as you see it. Did you know that? If you had writing and study skills at West High School by Kay Douglas, you would know that. Mine doesn't practical I'm sorry I was distracted. What did you say? Exactly. Thank you. I'm sorry. That was a bad joke. Read it several times aloud to yourself. And then, no offense, NASBers, but this is when it's great to have a different translation that you're also reading because you don't get paragraphs in NASB literal translation. It's easier to follow paragraphs as you go through another translation alongside of whatever you're reading. If it's a, if it's a linear literal you get the paragraphs better. You see the flow of a, of a thought or an argument. Think paragraphs. I cannot say that enough. I probably should have said it even out of context when we first came in. Think paragraphs. You know? Summarize what every paragraph means. What did that paragraph say? Just give me one quick sentence. Five words, maybe seven words, telling me what that paragraph said. And then tell me why. The author talks about both of those things. Why did he write that? What's the purpose of it? How does it fit his argument? All of this can be done without consulting a commentary, just by reading the word. And it's not just, it's by reading God's word, the God who wants you to know him through his word. He is not going to leave you hanging out there orphaned. And so read it through, think paragraphs, jot notes about what those paragraphs are, wasn't that good advice? Yeah. You're thinking, but Tom, that takes so much time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's perfect. Why wouldn't we want, I mean, I just, okay, so I've been a pastor for a long, long time. It's easy for me to sit on my ivory tower. Tom, you get paid to be good. I'm good for nothing. <laughs> you get paid to study. I study on my own because, you know, you you, you whet my appetite for that, but no. All of us, when we start to read the pages of Scripture, it's like this beautiful, multifaceted thing that opens itself to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you start seeing, like, the application of that Scripture every turn. You think, you find yourself, have you found yourself doing this where you want to quote the Scripture you're studying because it applies in the moment in your life? It's just like when you buy that car and you think, wow, I've got a fill in the blank. And then after you buy it, you see all those, everybody has that car, it seems. Every time you turn around, you see that car. 
oh, that, there, there's a Honda Civic there, and there's a Honda Civic there, and there's a Honda Civic there, and there's a Honda Civic there. It's because you have a Honda Civic, and you're interested in your Honda Civic, and then suddenly you see them everywhere. Well, if you study God's Word, it's even better. You start reading things out of 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, and you start seeing that that applies to your life, and you start seeing it that it's applying to your life constantly. I want that for you. So the historical context, eventually, the best way to figure that out <coughs> is to have, he says, a Bible dictionary. This is, this is I'm going to hold up the big scary book. Uh, this is a New Testament introduction. It gives you the occasion for the letter, whatever one you're reading. Uh, it gives you, even if it's one of the Gospels, even if it's um, the book of Acts, all of the New Testament books are in here. It gives you the purpose for it. It gives you the historical context of all of those cities. And if you read it in 1 Corinthians, it'll talk about Corinth and what was going on. We, we read some about what was going on in Corinth. Um, this is a great place to get the historical context and even some of the literary context as, as you move forward. And so the author moves into that literary context, and that's the whole think paragraphs thing. I'm... I'm Obviously, I kind of jumped into literary paragraph, you know, the paragraph thing, think paragraphs. But it gives you an outline of any one of the New Testament books in, in here. And so you can kind of see they've already given you the, the, the breakdowns of, of the thought in the book. And so then you can use that as a guide. If, you have, if, you're, um, if you're like a, uh, well, who are the no paragraphs? Are like the original King James, NASB, the ASV. Um, some of the ESVs don't break it down into paragraphs. I'm trying to remember which ones they are. But if you're trying to struggle with that and you want to stick with whatever book you are and it doesn't give you natural paragraph breaks, this is a, this is a way to do it. Um, I'll have it up here. An inter introduction to the New Testament. I'm, I'm going to put this on the resources guide on the app. So, and if you don't have the app, see a neighbor who has it and uh, we'll get you get you on that because there's all the resources are in there so um, so thinking paragraphs spending the time when you're studying a, a passage of scripture it's probably asking you to spend more time studying the Bible in a specific way than you perhaps have ever been asked and that's intentional I think on my part at least challenging you spend some time invest the time steal take away Pull time away from something else that you're doing so that you can spend time in his word. And just go through 1 Corinthians 1 through 4. You've got a sort of a guide that will walk you through it in the book. And do those paragraphs and write down what each of those paragraphs mean. Share it with somebody that's in here. Ask them what they think. This is what I think Paul's saying in, in, in those first four verses in, in chapter 1. Whatever. And See where that takes you. And uh, finish, the author finishes with those problem passages. I just don't want to be hung up on those in ways that trip us up and, and maybe can become an excuse to throw the whole thing away and just say, well, those are unknowable, so maybe all of the Bible's unknowable. That's not true. And none of those passages are really primary issues. They're always tertiary, which means not even secondary. They're sort of down here issues what's he saying there about dying for the dead or baptizing for the dead and if we didn't believe in the resurrection why would we be you know that whole argument out of first corinthians 15 verse 29 right yep. crazy stuff so now Jeannie, we're going to go to small groups and you're going to explain how we're going to do this so we're going to break up into small groups because okay. well, last time was a fiasco Okay, everybody, let's, uh, let's reassemble. Avengers, assemble. You'll be back? 
Ja. Oh. Can you guys make sure Mark puts his full name, cell number, and email on that so I can put him on the group list if you would like? Ask him if he wants that. I don't know. So. Okay. Attention. Attention, please. May I please have your attention? Up here. There we go. Works, works every time. So since this is an official Crosspoint class, I'm rolling up the sleeves. It's the way it works. <laughs> so uh, our, our friend in the class, uh, Jennifer, thought of a really cool thing. And that was that the church owns a bunch of, of uh, Bibles. They are up here in this tote, and then directly adjacent to the tote, there are three uh, Bibles. You can't have mine. My NLT filament is mine. You can't have it. But uh, if you would like a different translation than you have, and it's, it's uh, free 99, meaning it's free uh, for the taking. There's a bunch of KJVs up here for sure. Those, uh, those are the, probably the most that are up here, but there are other versions of the Bible that are legit translations that you would like to take. Then there's also... A paraphrase, there's a living Bible up here, which is not a translation, but a paraphrase. And that's, anybody remember chapter 2, right? Yeah. So that's way over on the right side of the, uh, of, the, of the graphic on that page. So. And there's, there's, this is just a sampling, pretty much all the versions of there. I think there's like three Bibles there that have side by side, but one of them has four different translations and one. Yes, they're interlinear or whatever they call them, when there's multiple translations on there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. There's some large print as well. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're looking for another version of the Bible, which you should be now after chapter two. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. We have the Bible, we have uh, one of each type of Bible pretty much, and that's in one area, but we do have commentaries. We didn't keep all the commentaries we had because people kept saying, oh no, you can just get that on your phone. And I'm like, well, we need to have commentaries. So we do have that and like Bible dictionaries and different things like that in the church library you can check out to, you know, go in there and study. Fred takes all those, and you can go to the regular library and get them either real or digital. Unless you're like us, who we don't have a library district, but you know. Yeah, we don't. Well, you chose them. Yeah, we're outside of you any library. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I didn't. But. <laughs> so, another housekeeping thing I will post. Uh, this on the resources guide, I'll, I, will, I haven't looked yet to see which is the least expensive way to get it. Uh, there's always that back and forth between Amazon and Christian book distributors. I'm no longer going to say CBD <laughs> because <laughs> it has a completely different connotation today. But uh, again, really great resource if you're starting a, a study on a book of the Bible in the New Testament, this guy right here. When we hit the Old Testament narratives in like three weeks, I'll bring the Old Testament version of this book. Um, the, the author is Gleason Archer. He was like 175 when I had him for class at Trinity. He wrote the book on Old Testament introduction. He just was really a phenomenal guy. And uh, I'll tell a story about him when we hit that, but uh, I'll bring that as well. I, I, these are just in case you would want that. Um, I, I hope that that is something that you're interested in, uh, because I am, so. 
So yeah, okay, so let's move to small group time. Is there anything that was confusing or a, a small group question you'd like to ask? We've now rebilleted, so we're in different groups as we're sitting around the tables, but that's okay. Something that you would want to ask. Dan, you don't get to go first every week. Well, nobody's hands going up, I wait. That's because everybody looks at you and goes, Dan's gonna ask a question. <laughs> My group would like a little bit uh, tighter definition of uh, task theology and uh, systematic theology. Task theology. <laughs> so, well, we did too. so what would we say to that? I, I, I don't want to come up with a definition if we could collectively do that. I have, I'm ready to talk about that, but there you go. What, what would you say about it? Yeah. Right. It's a specific thing. You're, you're taking a piece of theology and you're applying it in a specific area. And so um, if, if you were going to say cleanliness is important in your life, right? That's a general position to have. Cleanliness is good. You need to be careful when you have your ears pierced because you can really get a bad infection is a a specific application of that larger idea of cleanliness is important. So, if you, as you're reading in the in the uh, uh, all the Ians, any of those epistles, you're you're reading specific applications of bigger theological ideas. So you have this bigger idea, and Paul's saying, "Well, here's how it applies in marriage. Here's how it applies." You know what I'm saying? There's specific things, and to try and take that and and make it. You know, as you're saying something about earrings and make that into something that would apply the same in another context is, is doing a disservice to the idea of why that was said. So if you're taking a specific example of Paul and trying to apply it like parallel, perfectly parallel to something else, you're ripping it out of that task-oriented thing that you said that for and you're pulling it out of that context into a completely different context and chances of doing violence to the text and application at that time means you're doing bad hermeneutics. Okay. And remember, hermeneutics is how to apply legitimately in our current day that which we know applied back in the day. Yeah. So exegesis, how did it, how, what did it mean back then? Hermeneutics, what does it mean today? And we want to do both of those very well. And, and it breaks the rule of hermeneutics when we pull a task-oriented theology and rip it out of context and try to apply it somewhere else. And so we have to think in terms of what are the implications of that. Does that make sense? Yes. Very narrow usage of a particular theological idea. That's, that's the task side yep. of it. And what is the systematic side of it? The larger context. Um, so that's the broader concept. So I would use my first illustration. Tom texted Carrie to say, don't, don't go out on the roads, they're dangerous. The broader context, the larger systematic broader thing is we need to be careful about uh, how, how and where we drive our cars because it's a dangerous process. That's the larger context of it. So in specifically when Paul's talking about marriages, you want to take the context of, Every aspect of our lives should reflect Christ. That includes being a husband. That includes being a wife. That includes being a parent. That includes being a child. And so the, the broader context that Paul's operating from is your life ought to reflect Christ no matter what slice of your life I would take. Okay? And that's kind of the big idea. And that you cannot compartmentalize Christ in your life. If you're doing that, you're describing something other than what the Bible reveals about who Christ is in someone's life. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're breaking the rule. <coughs> it's something other than. You've pulled too many pieces out of the mouse trap. It is no longer going to trap a mouse. It's something else. You've pulled too many pieces out. So, Okay, other questions? Other comments? Yes? I don't know if I need to say another question. I, I know you sent out something that was talking about the filament thing we were going to do today. Yeah, no one was here. <laughs> I was here. 
I'll do it afterwards. How about that? Well, we'll sit down and do it then. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. I, Yes, you should, always, with me. I, I am a... Th yep. I, if you're around me long enough, I'm kind of thick-headed. And eat, oh yeah. No, no, if you go, uh-uh, if you go like this. Go like this. Everybody go like this. Put your fingers on your wrist right here. Do you feel a, a thump, 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 thump? That means you're, you're not the smartest person in the world. So. I just got to say. No, you're fine, as far as you know. Yes, so um, if you're getting a filament Bible, I would love to help you figure that out for sure. Uh, any other questions, comments? Was this a little less confusing now? Yeah? Does it good to have table readers assigned to you? So let's, let's address that a little bit. So why would I not want to assign table leaders? What would there, you think, it's purposeful. Why would I not assign table leaders as we go to small groups? What would be a reason? Spontaneity. Spontaneity, okay. Involvement. Involvement. Yep. Yep. If you're not sure, you're welcome to come and talk to me about it for sure. Absolutely. Um, I'm not. I'm not as worried about that. I'm more worried about wrestling with it. And then if if afterwards you're sure you didn't get something, I would love to make sure. That's a great question. What do we do if we don't think we got it? What was what was going after? The question was going after. So, but that's the time to ask here. Like. I would just really want our, I want our Christian pride to fall down with that. I, I've spent enough time in Sunday school. Remember when I started the, cl the class and I talked about the fact that I knew that Jesus was the answer to every question? Yeah. Even though it was a brown, furry little animal with a fuzzy tail that jumps from tree to tree, the answer is Jesus, not a squirrel. <coughs> because it's Sunday school. I just don't want to be there. And there's every reason that you should feel that, that, though, you know, like that pressure to get it right. But we need each other in this. Part of the reason I didn't want to answer Dan's question is because we need this collective piece to guardrail each other. And I, I don't want to set up a small group leader because how much has the church left it to the professional Christians to hand down authority and all of that when the point of this class is for you to be self-feeding and to gain confidence. And there's a specific reason why I didn't name a table leader because I don't want just one leader to be the one doing it all, the whole time. And I kind of waited for that question to come up and it, it must have hurt or it got irritating enough to wonder about it, which is good. And more, more of a yeah. That, at least for me, we I've sat down at three different tables now, and everybody looks at each other. We yep. need to read the first question. Yep. But because really, I mean, that's all the, the facilitator, that's all the person is doing. Yep. Is reading the question, and everybody's talking. So now I get to say, let's feel the right to be the facilitator no matter who you are. Maybe you're the least likely person in the room as you see it, but you could do a great job. And if you talk all the time, stop it. <laughs> you, you know who you are. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because I'm that guy. I totally am. And if I'm given the room, man, I'll, I'll take up all the oxygen. It frustrates me sometimes. But I really want you to be so given the authority to speak up and, and ask questions and work questions out in your groups. And if it takes you guys sitting down and say, okay, who's gonna 
uh, be the question facilitator when, whenever group you're in, then do that at the beginning. I'm not going to do it. I think it's something that you can do, which I, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I just, I think that we've done a disservice to church in many ways where it was leave it to the professional Christians. Remember I said earlier, as a pastor, I got paid to be good and you guys get to be good for nothing as volunteers. Ha ha. It's a joke, but it's like, I think we've done that so much that we've atrophied, we've, we've weakened the body. And it's my job here, as I see it, to strengthen the body. I know that my brother wants everyone to come to this class because he wants strong Christians. I want you guys reading your Bibles and going up on a Sunday morning and go, wait a minute, what about this? Why did you say that when it's, this is what the text says? I love that. That engaging, I spoke for you, I'm sorry, and you're, it's because you're here, but I would have said it anyway, I promise. But that you are dangerous Christians. Remember I said I wanted you to be dangerous. Yes? To be the priesthood of all believers. The first week I talked about that. We went into passages of scripture. We talked from Hebrews. And, and that God's idea is that we are all priests. We are all active participants in the body of Christ. And that atrophy has happened where we see ourselves as second class citizens. When you have been called by the king. As a member of his family. He calls you his child. He has no grandchildren. He only has children. And that's why I went to this passage of, I want you to see the word like it's rich honey. It's like this savory thing that you fill your life with. And you're being given authority by the high king to be a priest in his kingdom. And I don't want you to see yourself as anything less. Because anything less would be to be unbiblical. And that makes you dangerous to the enemy. And that expands the kingdom. Because we don't bring people to Christ. Christ brings people to Christ. And when we are willing participants in what he is at work doing all the time, watch what happens. When you get dangerous with your word, when you put your feet firmly on the ground and you know what your Bible says, and you are pacing with the Spirit of God, you are dangerous to the enemy because the kingdom is on the move with you. You get goosebumps when you think about that? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, that's what the scriptures say, not what Tom says. And that's the reason for reading this book. That's the reason for hanging on and, and trying your level best not to get drowned. And that's why I want you to ask those questions in, in the group chat or email me, some of, uh, um, some have emailed me and says, I, I, I don't do the chat, here's my question, and so then I'll email them back. And, uh, and so, inter interacting with one another and a rising tide raises all boats. Yes. So, think, yes? We do have one more question. We have two minutes. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, it's the fourth question on the second page. That says, I think that's more of a generalized question for you as a disciple and a priest to, okay. to, to look at because it, it changes the attitude you go to the text about. Yeah. And I think also when we're confused by something, it puts it in proper perspective as well. Wait a minute. These two knew each other really well. When Paul wrote, you're saved through childbirth, ladies, his audience kind of knew what he was talking about. We don't. Right? So... I think it's important for us to kind of keep that in mind and say, okay, I'm on a scavenger hunt here to discover what the original context was. We have really great resources that can help us get there, but some of those things we're just not going to definitively know, and we have to take the, whatever is the convenient answer to that. So... I think that's the best way I would answer that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? 
can we, can we close with a word of prayer and see you guys next week when we read this, the hermeneutical issues about epistles? Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you that this time was spent seeking after you, that we have a place that values this sort of thing, that we have each other to experience this class together. Father, by your Holy Spirit, rise the tide in our midst, that we would have confidence and that we would be dangerous to the enemy and great for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. See you guys next week. I don't know if I made it clear, but you can have the Bible. <laughs>